All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to this Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Today, we are delighted to welcome Karsten Baum, who is currently an assistant professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. And he, before that, he completed a postdoc at Bagan University in Israel. And in 2016, he got his PhD degree from Aarhus University. And his main research interests lie in the area of efficient zero knowledge protocols and applications of secure computation to blockchains. And today he will talk to us about zero knowledge proofs for large circuits. Um, thank you, Karsten. Thank you. Um, and good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me just share my slides again so you can see them. Good. Now we have a discussion basis. That's fantastic. And uh, I just need to hide this thing here, too. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. If there's if there's anything, um, I, I I think your rules are that you know right into the right into the chat. Um, I'm also fine if you uh, stop me in the middle and uh, say, Carson, I have a question. Um, you know, clarifying questions I think would can, can also take them during um, this presentation. So um, what I will talk about today is zero knowledge proofs for large circuits. And uh, this encompasses um, two different works. Um, the first one be that appeared at crypto this year. The second one is, is going to appear at CCS this year. And um, and um, I'll I'll start out, I guess, by motivating <clears throat> why we want to do this and and what is going on, and then I'll go a bit into the details and techniques. And for all of you who've been more looking into uh, Doctrine related uh, ZK in the past. What what I'll do here is is entirely different from uh, from the techniques that you usually see uh, in these in these cases. Good. Um, so just a quick definition uh, of of zero knowledge proofs. So what I'm going to care about is uh, I'm going to care about uh, let's say statements X um, and witnesses W, and I encode my statement as a circuit over a field of arbitrary characteristic. And what I want is that uh, my circuit outputs zero uh, on this witness. That's when I say that the statement is in the uh, language and uh, otherwise it's not. Um, and, and I'll model uh, circuit evaluation, as you can see here on the left, um, as um, you know, we, we, we kind of flatten out the circuit. It has addition and multiplication gates over the respective field, right? We feed uh, the witness as inputs uh, to to the first layer of of gates from this from the circuit, and then we just evaluate bop, 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 throughout the circuit uh, until we have a, a value at the output gate, um, and that is uh, what we say then is the uh, output of the circuit on this on this witness. Um, yes, and then obviously, uh, what is a zero knowledge proof in this in this regard, right? So it's uh, uh, right. We have a setting with the prover and the verifier, where the prover knows uh, this witness and the circuit C. The verifier only knows the circuit, right? And wants to be convinced that the circuit is true, which is a claim, uh, or which that the circuit evaluates on some witness to zero, which is the claim that the prover makes. Right, and for that, the two of them run an interactive protocol at the end of which the verifier says accept or reject. So far, so good. So this is, you know, uh, zero knowledge proofs, as you all know and love them. And uh, we obviously require from them that they are complete, meaning if uh, right C of W indeed is zero, then the verifier should always accept. We want soundness that, in this case, knowledge soundness. If the prover doesn't have such a witness, then um, the verifier will, with overwhelming probability, output reject. And zero knowledge means the verifier knows nothing or learns nothing beyond the fact that the circuit is true, or evaluates to, to zero in this case. Okay, so far so good. Zero knowledge is, as uh, you know, we've all done done and loved it uh, since since our childhood. So um, the case of or the setting of zero knowledge proofs that I care about in this talk here are um, zero knowledge proofs for exploits. So here we would have uh, our Alice down here and our Bob up there. And Alice wants to prove to Bob that she has uh, an exploit for a, for a program. Um, what does it mean? Well, if we want to prove such a thing in zero knowledge, that means that Alice can encode <clears throat> both the program and 
<coughs> sorry, and uh, exploit in uh, some kind of zero knowledge friendly form. And obviously this one here should be a zero, meaning so she encodes the program into some kind of circuit pi prime. She encodes the the exploit that makes uh, like for example the program seg fault into into some kind of witness, and then this evaluates to to zero if and only if uh, whatever Alice there had is actually a valid exploit for a program p. Um, so that means, right, that Alice runs the encoding of um, of the program into circuit form, and she encodes the um, the exploit into some witness form. Uh, Bob can only do the same encoding uh, of the program, but uh, not the witness, right? And then both of them are going to use a zero knowledge protocol. At the end of which, uh, Bob gets uh, right zero one. Obviously, we want we want it to output zero, uh, so that is my mistake here. But yeah, obviously, what, what we want is that Bob um, uh, learns that there is an exploit for a program. Um, yes, and, and and nothing else. Um, so so why is this uh, let's say different from the from the usual setting? Well, the problem is that if that we want to encode rather large statements, um, so the the program uh, encodings the circuits that we talk about will be in the uh, hundreds of gigabytes. Um, so for that, standard proof techniques um, that you know from the blockchain world are not going to fly because the prover overhead is just too too enormous. Um, and what do we need in order to build this? Well, we first of all need to uh, we'll be able to encode actually uh, programs and exploits in the zero knowledge friendly form. Um, and we need to construct uh, a proof system that is efficient enough to execute the proof. And as you might have guessed from uh, the title of my talk, I'm going to focus on the second part uh, in this talk here. And uh, just to um, you know, give you know credit where credit is due. So this is part of a larger project uh, together with uh, partners at uh, Galois, Kedit, uh, KU Leuven. And, and Columbia University. Um, and uh, this uh, proof that we're building here is part of this uh, second part where we try to, to build this efficient uh, proof system for running, uh, you know, proving um, knowledge of exploits in a zero knowledge friendly form. Um, where we're currently uh, in building this is uh, there is a, um, an existing um, a compiler which takes LLVM code of a program as input together with a trace that you know makes, for example, the program seg fault. Uh, there exists a compiler uh, for uh, doing the encoding to circuits and and uh, witnesses, uh, which are then over defined over let's say rank as rank one constraint systems. And then you use what is called the the mac and cheese proof system to actually prove. Um, that this exploit is, uh, is is existing, right? So here, the cheesecloth compiler is the first uh, part that I talked about, this zero knowledge friendly encoding. The second part is the mac and cheese proof system that, as I said, has to do things differently than um, standard zero knowledge proof systems. Okay, and uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I mean, this motivating what we're doing. What I'm going to talk about mainly is uh, this make and cheese knowledge proof system, which, uh, as was mentioned in the announcement, appeared at Crypto 2021. And if we have time, I'm only go also going to go to uh, this so-called up and seller to brie uh, conversion technique, which optimizes uh, how these two work together, but can also find other applications, um, which and this this goes over both of these uh, sites here. Okay, let's get started with mac and cheese. So this is uh, joint work with uh, Alex Malozimov and Mark Rosen from Galua and uh, Peter Scholl, who's also at uh, Aarhus University. And what we're going to look at is your knowledge proofs for um, Boolean and arithmetic circuits. So uh, pick the field size, field characteristic that you want. Um, and uh, what we in particular want to have is nested disjunction. I'll, uh, talk to you, uh, I'll explain to you what this actually means. And it's a, a novel commit and proof styles in knowledge protocol uh, for circuits over any field. And uh, as mentioned, we want to have these 
these nested disjunctions, uh, which is a more efficient way of, of communicating proofs. And our proof system is actually practically efficient. So it takes our um, it takes the whole pipeline, uh, including pre-processing and everything, 140 nanoseconds per end gate or 100 uh, or 1.5 microsecond per uh, proven multiplication of whatever 61-bit field. As usual, only the uh, you know ends and multiplications are actually what, what counts. The additions you get for free, and the communication is. Um, for any multiplication is around one field element, one plus epsilon, where epsilon is uh, an actual tiny constant. And um, yeah, so obviously what you get is a proof that is linear in the uh, size of the, of the circuit, but uh, linear with a constant that is essentially one. Um, and it's uh, running really, really fast, both on the prover and the verifier side, which is a trade-off that we make here. Okay, so to build this thing, uh, well, first of all, what is this uh, commit and proof paradigm on, on, on which we build? Right, these are uh, proof systems that are you know well well understood, have been around since, uh, as far as I know, 1998, with the work by uh, Kramer and Damgaard, where who presented this for uh, discrete log based uh, commitments, Peterson commitments uh, back then. So you use homomorphic commitments for that and pick your pick your favorite homomorphic commitment scheme. You can build uh, a zero knowledge proof out of that. How do you do this? Well, uh, assume your, your statement is in circuit form um, as, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, right? So what does the prover do? So the prover simply com uh, uh, commits to uh, all the individual elements of the witness separately. Then it evaluates the circuits uh, that I also mentioned in the introduction simply on the commitment. So it, uh, uh, it, it, it commits to uh, all the intermediate gate outputs and it proves that the gate output is consistent with each of the, um, with each of the gate inputs. So this we can do consecutively by evaluating the circuit. In the end, we know that the output commitment is as the commitment to the right output wire. And we just open the output commitment and show it at zero. And this way we have uh, proven that this is actually, uh, that, that the prover knows a witness to, to the circuit where, uh, well, the homomorphism gives us the, and opening the zero in the end gives us the, uh, the soundness. The whole thing is zero knowledge because the commitment is, uh, is hiding and binding also helps with the soundness proof, I would say. Okay, so this is a standard technique that has been around uh, very, very long, and which is the basis of, of what we are going to do. And actually, um, obviously, I mean, you need to prove additions and multiplications over, over the field, right? But uh, um, what Kama and Damgaard showed is that linearly homomorphic commitments are actually sufficient for this. So you can, from let's say a commitment to X and a commitment to Y for public constant alpha, beta, gamma, you can derive uh, here alpha times X plus beta times Y plus gamma uh, in, in committed form without any interaction between the prover and the verifier. Right, so this allows you to simply evaluate uh, linear gates by just applying the gate function uh, on, on the respective commitments and for multiplication gates, well, you gotta prove that um, a, a, a commitment is a commitment to <clears throat> A times B in this case, uh, using uh, usually a random multiplication triple. So the prover is gonna send some additional information, which the two of them then can use to, uh, to figure out if, if something is actually a valid multiplication triple or not, or if something is a valid product of two uh, commitment openings. And what we would use in this case is uh, what is called Beaver circuit uh, randomization technique. Okay, so far so good. So there are standard techniques around for uh, once you have a homomorphic commitment, linearly homomorphic commitment to build a zero knowledge proof. We're gonna build a bit on these, but uh, we're gonna turn it up to uh, extreme. Okay, so with, with this as the foundations, let's build the Mac and Cheese protocol. Um, so the, a, a core building block that we're going to need is uh, vector oblivious uh, linear evaluation. So this is a, 
a generalization of, of the uh, you know, popular oblivious transfer, which works over arbitrary fields. So here you have um, one side, the sender, inputting uh, two values, alpha and beta. And on the right side, you have the receiver inputting uh, a field element. And the vector OLE is a secure protocol that then outputs uh, alpha times that random point plus beta. So this, um, this linear um, uh, relation. And uh, so this is, this is what is called OLE. And if now alpha uh, and beta are vectors, then we call this vector OLE, where you get uh, the same, uh, you know, the same linear uh, combination for the same R uh, for many uh, different uh, alpha and beta. So yeah, this, this uh, alpha is fixed across multiple iterations and you can actually highly efficiently instantiate this these days from uh, LPN-based constructions, uh, work due to uh, Boyle et al. And there's also this so-called uh, ferret, uh, I think it was in, in the ferret or no, in the Wolverine uh, vector all E uh, protocol. So they allow you to uh, set up a, a vector all E uh, correlation, so one correlation, with a communication of 0 0.4 bits and you know a computation of 85 uh, nanoseconds uh, on the prover and verifier side. So after this, you have a, a random a vector OLE set up between uh, two parties. Okay, so if you look at this, hmm, this could be potentially helpful in uh, setting up a commit and proof style proof system, uh, and indeed it is because you if you if you tilt your head a little bit. Well, uh, you know, what is a random uh, vector OLE? Well, you can look at it as a Mac um, on the value uh, R uh, that you have. So if you, give, um, if you give M and R to the uh, verifier, uh, to the prover, and alpha and beta uh, to the verifier, well, you uh, got yourself an uh, information theoretic Mac on the value R. And the, um, the the prover can only send uh, can only open this to to one value later. And actually, since you fix uh, the multiplier alpha here uh, over over different instances, uh, you can actually make this linearly homomorphic. So okay, assume we can we can set up these random vector LE instances. Uh, well, this gives us a, why does this give us a commitment scheme? Because we can only commit to random values this way, right? Uh, because the uh, the prover always inputs or maybe gets R from the vector well E box and uh, the verifier sees these alphas and betas. Well, the prover can obviously correct um, this value R to an uh, arbitrary uh, value, which this uh, correlation holds by sending the difference of the value he wants to commit to and um, and the randomness he got uh, to uh, to the verifier, the verifier and outputs uh, updates his uh, his beta value as part of the correlation, and this way you can you can you can change your correlation from a that is for R to a correlation that holds over an arbitrary value that the prover chooses. This way you get a commitment to a value that and the prover chooses. And later on, if you want to open, well, uh, the prover simply sends uh, R, or if he changed it to something, we'd call it X, as well as the Mac that he holds uh, to the verifier. The verifier just checks if this linear relationship holds. So observe that this is a very uh, simple uh, way of creating commitments because you just uh, run the vector all E box uh, between the prover and the verifier, and then you just send one field element, namely the correction value between the randomness and the value you actually want to commit to. And if you want to open, you just send two field elements. So this is, uh, this is computationally really light, and as I mentioned, the vector OLE can super efficiently be implemented these days. Um, and if you actually want to, uh, if you want to commit to uh, something, uh, something small, let's say a bit, um, then this seems to be a terrible idea. Uh, if you um, if you want to figure if you want to check that right the the binding property uh, of the commitment you gain uh, from this linear correlation is actually uh, only scaling in the size of the underlying field 
Uh, so if, if your field has size uh, two, right, that doesn't really give you any, uh, any binding. Um, but what you can do is, uh, is you can use subfield vector OLE, which you can also construct as efficiently as this normal vector OLE, where now your committed, uh, your relation is over an extension field, but your randomness R comes from a base field. So later on when you, uh, when you commit, again, you only have to send uh, a bit, for example, to, to correct, but if you open, you actually have to send a long string, uh, which corresponds to the extension field element. But again, these things can be set up uh, super efficiently these days using these LPN-based constructions. And also this, uh, uh, as, as you can uh, easily uh, imagine, this gives you a designated verifier proof. Why is this? Well, uh, we rely on the fact that the uh, prover never gets to know uh, alpha and beta. If he does, then um, all security breaks down because now there's only a linear relation that you have to, uh, you know, that you have to compute in order to adjust your Mac to a, and, 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 you know, thus your committed value to an arbitrary value that you want to have. So inherently you can't change this to a, um, to a standard publicly verifiable as your knowledge proof. Again, this is a, um, well, this is, this, this is a uh, constraint that we're willing to, to make in order to get a highly efficient proof system for really large statements. Okay, but yeah, these are, so this is a, this is a drawback from this, this kind of approach. Well, and um, if we have this thing, can I sorry? ask a question? Yes. Uh, so this commitment scheme is basically interactive or can it be in yes. Um I mean, once the, once the, so it's, it's, it, it, it is non-interactive in the, in the pre-processing phase. So once you have set up the uh, LPN correlation, then mm -hmm. afterwards uh, you just send the correction value to, uh, that allows you to, to commit to something. So then the prover just says, I commit by sending the, dis the difference between uh, the, the randomness it has from the uh, vector OLE protocol and the value it actually wants to commit to. Okay. So there, there, it, there it works like a, um, so that works like a, a, a normal commitment scheme, but uh, you have to uh, pre-compute these. We have to share these uh, vector OLE uh, relations first, and that might require a bit of interaction. But there, the overhead also isn't too high, so you can these days, in a, I don't know, I think in a very small number of rounds, uh, set up hundreds of thousands of these vector OLE correlations. Um, so you don't have to do all of them uh, sequentially, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so as I said, um, there's the commit and proof paradigm. There is um, our uh, um, there's our use of vector only as a commitment, right? So from this we can very simply, you know, throw them to, the two of them together, and we get. Um, a uh, zero knowledge proof already. So uh, that, that was that was very fast, right? We're only in uh, we're only half an hour in the seminar talk, and we're already done. Well, I mean, I, as you can guess, a, a bit more is coming. Um, so th this gives us what we call the simple protocol of mac and cheese, where I use the vector OLE uh, to set up uh, commitments uh, to the witness, and then you use the uh, homomorphism to evaluate the circuit uh, gate by gate, but again, linear gates are simple, um, and so we optimize how you actually prove uh, multiplication gates. How do we do this? Um, well, we let the prover uh, commit to uh, the product uh, using an extra commitment. You can't really avoid this, like at some point, um, the output of the multiplication gate must be committed to. Um, we get um, random um, commitments to random values cheaply. As I said, the vector will e-box is very happy to give us uh, correlations on random values that we have to correct later. So we just take one of these things, which you get for free. Let's call this a commitment to A. And uh, we, so we additionally commit to the product of A times uh, times the second term y of the multiplicative relation we want to want to prove 
uh, being correct, right? And then the the uh, verifying that this multiplication, the output of this multiplication gate is correct, is is then uh, works as follows. Well, we let the verifier send a random challenge. The prover is going to open uh, a uh, linear combination of of x and a. Um, this perfectly hides uh, the value x um, because a can be uh, arbitrary random. And then we just show that a certain uh, a certain relation is, uh, is is a commitment to zero. And if you if you uh, put together uh, these things and, and then check out the math, you can actually uh, easily see that if the if the prover committed to something that was not a correct uh, linear uh, combination, if there was not a correct multiplication, then there would only be one. Uh, e for which uh, it could cheat and otherwise the prover uh, the verifier would catch him so this is actually a sound way of proving uh, the multiplication is correct and uh, as you can see we only use linear operations on the commitments here but we pay because we have to communicate and the cool thing is for our check well we want to prove that uh, a commitment is a commitment to zero Right, but that means that we don't actually have to send uh, a full opening because uh, you know the, the prover and the verifier know uh, that uh, the message should be zero, so all they have to send is is the MAC value on the message. Uh, so instead of two field elements, actually you only have to send one, which is a neat, uh, you know, tiny uh, improvement. So this, uh, if you if you count, let's count. Right, so how many field elements do you have to communicate to, to verify one multiplication? Well, you have to, um, well, you naturally have to uh, commit to uh, Z, the output. Um, you have to send C, which is this uh, product of A and Y. Um, and then you have to, uh, the verifier sends a challenge. Well, you could use the fiat Shamir transform to make this non-interactive in some ways. So I'll not get into detail here. But then you have to open uh, this value e times x minus a, this value epsilon. So there you have to uh, communicate something too. And in the end, you have this assert zero, but you could do a, a lot of zero tests uh, simultaneously using you know, random linear combination standard techniques. So this is, uh, so you have to send three field elements uh, in order to show that this is uh, a correct multiplication. So this is, let's say, the base uh, way of doing things. This is a standard uh, proof of multiplication, uh, which sends, as mentioned, three field elements for, for a large field. And maybe you have to send more if you, do, if you would use this uh, over, let's say, the field of two. So the question is, can we do better? <clears throat> and here we actually uh, construct a recursive uh, dot product check, or we use a, a recursive dot product check uh, due to Bonnet et al. And this allows us to, uh, by increasing the round complexity uh, for the multiplication check from, from constant to uh, logarithmic in the number of multiplications that we check, so this gets <clears throat> down the communication from, uh, from three field elements uh, per multiplication to one point epsilon, where epsilon is 0 0.08. Uh, communicated field elements per uh, multiplication that we prove, and you always kind of have to, you always have to send uh, the output of the uh, of the multiplication anyway. So uh, there's there's basically no overhead um, from this from this verification. And uh, yeah, so this is the round complexity, but this is for proving n. Uh, LM, n multiplications to be correct in parallel. So now the question is, how do we do this? Uh, and this is where things get a bit more interesting. So let's say we have uh, we have n of these uh, multiplications that we want to check. So we want to use a um, a linear a, a, an inner product uh, check for that, right? So where we uh, instead of like checking all of them individually, we want to check that uh, a sum of all of these products that we have here on top is the same as the sum of all the Z values that we have on the bottom. Now, obviously, if the prover knows that we are going to do a, uh, we're going to verify this relation and not all the multiplications, well, then there are easy ways to cheat uh, in this proof. 
uh, right? So the first thing that you actually do is, well, you let the verifier choose uh, random values alpha uh, and say, tell the prover, you know what, instead of, um, instead of proving to me, um, you know, all the multiplications that you wanted to do before, instead prove to me uh, that alpha, so instead of, for example, x1 times y1 being z1, prove to me that uh, alpha times x1 times y1 is the same as alpha uh, 1 times z1. Um, and what you actually can show is that uh, if you choose alpha uniformly at random in this case, um, so, so first of all, obviously for every alpha this is going to work. Second, uh, our commitments are linearly homomorphic, so the proof of the verifier can update their commitments to you know, alpha times that, that commitment, so that's not a problem. But if you originally had um, something, uh, a system that, uh, where, where the multiplications were not correct, but it would, you would get a, that the, um, the, uh, the, the inner product relation would hold, well, now you're in a setting where with overwhelming probability, the, um, the, you, you would see the error, the linear uh, uh, relation would not hold over this if the multiplication triples weren't correct. Whereas if you start from correct multiplications, you get to something where uh, the inner product uh, still holds. So by re-randomizing this thing with some input from the verifier, we can say, uh, okay, now we are in a form where we can uh, check uh, like where we now only check the inner product instead of all multiplications separately, and then we hope that we can actually check the inner product of uh, an inner product of length n um, in a cheaper way than you know checking n multiplications separately. And this uh, trick from uh, Bonnet et al., which we adapt, actually shows that you that you can. Well, how does this work? Well, you have the um, so we have this relation here. This is this is what we want to show, and we have that the prover is committed to alpha i x i. It's committed to y i, and it's committed to these alpha i z i. Now it wants to show that the sum over all these things uh, is indeed doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay, let's let's try to verify this. How can we do this? Well, first of all, um, you're gonna define yourself some commit uh, some some <clears throat> some polynomials. And uh, so this is only what the prover does, and the prover does this in, in its head. So the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the commitments never actually wander from, uh, the, the polynomials never wander from the prover to the verifier. So um, the prover is gonna set up n over two uh, polynomials f. Well, we for example, say that the first polynomial evaluated in zero gives you the first left term of, uh, of your inner product. So uh, f1 evaluated in zero is alpha one x1. Uh, polynomial one f1 evaluated in point one gives you alpha two x2. So that's the second uh, the second element from the uh, um, from the vector that goes into the inner product. So the second polynomial in point zero is alpha three x x3. The f2 evaluated in point one is alpha four x4, and so on and so forth. So this allows you to define n over two polynomials, which uh, evaluate at the respective points to uh, alpha i, x i. Now you can do the same with uh, the uh, elements you have on the right side here, the y i, and you def just define a polynomial g, or you define n over two polynomials g in the same way, where uh, right, g1 at point zero is, is y, uh, one and g1 at point one is y2 and so on and so forth. Okay, that's a very systematic way of setting things up at polynom as polynomials, and we're obviously going to use this. And the cool thing is, well, I mean, this is all only stuff that the prover can do in its head. And and this defining these these, these uh, polynomials doesn't need any extra uh, communication, right? The uh, prover at this point is already committed to uh, alpha i x i and committed to y i. Uh, so there's 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 no extra communication after this tilting or perhaps head step as uh, looking at things as um, as polynomials. Now we uh, define ourselves um, a uh, a polynomial h. And what is h going to be? Well, h is the sum that I get if I 
take F1 and multiply it with G1, and then I take F2 and multiply it with G2, and so on and so forth, and I get a take Fn over 2 and multiply it with Gn over 2. And now I sum all of these, uh, you know, products of, of polynomials of degree 2 up. So I get a polynomial H, which is of degree 4. And um, if, you, if, you, if you look at what does this polynomial evaluate to, well, at point, at point 0, it evaluates to uh, all the, uh, the sum of all the even uh, alpha i, x i, y i. So it should be the sum of uh, all, the, uh, all the odd. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so all the, all the alpha, uh, alpha i, x i, y i with an odd uh, index. So you can, it, it's going to be at, at point zero, the sum of all the odd z i. And at point one, it's the, gonna, going to be the sum of all the uh, z i with an even index. And only at point, uh, evaluation point two and three, uh, we have to uh, commit to, to something else. So the prover is going to commit uh, to two more evaluations of h. Then he has, uh, and there are uh, four, um, uh, commitments to four points of H. It's, H is a polynomial of degree, uh, uh, should be a polynomial of degree three in this case, I hope. No, two plus minus one, uh, who cares? And uh, so, so by committing to these uh, evaluation points, uh, the prover has then fully, uh, yeah, fully committed to H. And actually what you next do is you let the verifier choose a random evaluation point and just check that this definition of H actually holds. Um, and, and this is sufficient. So what Bonnet et al. Have, have shown is that if you, if, you do, uh, if you just check H in one random point and you open Fi and Gi uh, in, in a point R, um, then, uh, and, and, and check this, this, in a, this, this relationship that you have here, uh, this actually establishes that uh, the whole inner product uh, was correct. And now what you, uh, well, well, once you let the verifier choose a random point R, where well, you can evaluate F and G um, uh, on R uh, as, a, as a linear operation. So you can compute a commitment to Fi and Gi uh, using only linear operations on existing commitments. And the same for H once uh, enough evaluation points of H have been committed to. But then, okay, so instead of, instead of directly opening that H at point R, uh, this H at point R and the Fi at point R and Gi at point R, we're going to again uh, verify that uh, H of, at point R uh, is the same as, uh, as, as this here in zero knowledge. But as I said, we can easily, uh, we, can, we can compute the evaluation at a point R uh, linearly without any extra communication. But then what, what, what are we doing actually? What are we verifying? Well, we are again verifying an inner product relation. But this time, um, we only have n over 2 uh, terms in, in our sum. So we started out with uh, an inner product of length n that we tried to verify, and now we're at an inner product of length two. So if you apply this thing uh, log n times, you're down to a uh, constant number of multiplications. Multiplications you can uh, you have to verify, and now we just take uh, the standard check that takes three multiplications to verify one, and you're done. So this is a, an amortization of how to check a lot of multiplications. Uh, at, at once, and uh, what you can see is that uh, what what do we send in each recursion? Well, we let in each recursive step uh, let the verifier uh, choose one random evaluation point, because we can use the fiat shamir transform. But we have that the prover himself has to commit to two values per recursive step, uh, which are these extra evaluation points of h. So we send uh, so. Uh, asymptotically, we send, uh, in addition to the, to the uh, commitments to the products that we need to do anyway, we send uh, log n uh, field elements or O of log n field elements. Right, so this is just a, a logarithmic overhead. 
which then, uh, right, if you if you choose n large enough, uh, this becomes negligible in uh, whatever else you're actually doing. Okay, so uh, with this at hand, uh, let's go to uh, the second step, which makes uh, mac and cheese uh, definitely very interesting over other proof systems, and it's that's called nested disjunctions. But what are what are nested disjunctions? And here. Uh, we um, we assume that our proof is uh, our circuit that we are doing is such that uh, it has multiple sub circuits. So, for example, you have a left circuit that we call C1 and the right circuit that we call C2. They might contain something different. And now you have the outputs of the respective circuits. And what you want to verify is that does either of these sub circuits evaluate to zero? Right? You're you're uh, you're satisfied if uh, for example, uh, your left circuit outputs uh, outputs zero, or if your right uh, sub circuit outputs zero. Uh, so you're kind of you're computing an OR uh, of the outputs of these individual sub circuits. So this is uh, this is what we call a disjunction, or what other people would call it too. <clears throat> and now we we have what we did in our proof uh, is that we on the protocol is we looked at. Um, this uh, type of uh, circuits and ask ourselves, so what can we do better? Do we have to evaluate uh, and send all the individual circuits C1 and C2 uh, in this case, or can we do something smarter than that? And, excuse me, what we, uh, what we came up with is an optimization that uh, only communicates um, information that, that is proportional to the longest branch of, of the, uh, uh, in the disjunction. So if you have, uh, if you have, a, if you compute an OR of uh, N different branches, then we uh, construct a, a, our proof system in such a way that the prover only communicates something that is proportional to the longest branch, but not to, uh, not, not something that is proportional to all uh, to sending all branches individually. And how do we do this? Well, um, we observe that the prover's messages, when you prove any of the sub-circuits, so if you prove, prove sub-circuit C1, or sub-circuit C2, or C3, or whatever. So because we have a zero-knowledge proof, at some point in our proof, we have shown that whatever the prover sends to the verifier when doing so, uh, looks like random field elements. So if you do uh, if you multiply or if you do commitments, um, then if you, or you create new commitments, then all the verifier ever sees is uh, random messages. Um, okay. So if I would take, for example, the messages. So this this means that if I take the messages from the first branch and uh, tell the prover, uh, tell the verifier use these uh, for the second branch, then the verifier has no idea, uh, the verifier has no idea of telling that this is true or not, right? So if I give him random, random, uh, a random evaluation of, for example, circuit one, and I didn't tell, they, they don't, I don't tell him, use these messages that I, that I give you. Uh, he doesn't know if he should use them on, on sub-circuit C1 or sub-circuit C2. Assuming that they are uh, similarly structured in the non-random things that, I, that I'm sending. Okay, so, so then the next step is to say, well, if the prover doesn't know, then I'm, if the verifier doesn't know, then I'm only going to send him uh, the, the messages that you uh, can use for evaluating the, the true branch, um, and maybe I pad them with some extra messages. And the verifier is going to use them for all the individual branches. So the same messages he is he's going to use for all the individual branches. Um, and this is still going to be fine. And this means that I only communicate information proportional to uh, to the true branch that, uh, that 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 we're actually taking, but the verifier doesn't see what the true branch actually is. Okay. So um, let's let's try to do this uh, a, a bit more formal. So we have uh, that we want to prove a disjunction over over these m clauses, where uh, one in the the clause ci uh, evaluates to zero, 
as I said, the prover sends messages uh, that correspond to evaluating CI. Uh, the verifier, as I said, um, sends random challenges, but he now sends them for all branches. But he don't, doesn't know where the uh, verifier is using them for. Now both, uh, uh, so now both, uh, so you, you, only, you only communicate something that is uh, for the respective branch that you are, uh, that you know evaluates to zero, but you still have to figure out what are the commitments on the other branches given these messages. So um, the parties um, still uh, compute the commitments uh, on the outputs of all the, all the M branches using, uh, using the messages that the prover just sent. And what you can show is that um, these, these commitments are going to be commitments to random messages, uh, except for YI, uh, which is where you know, the circuit evaluated to zero. And now you just run an OR proof, which shows that there exists one of these M commitments that is a zero commitment. And there goes your, and, and this is your uh, you know, disjunction proof. And what you can see is that, the, as, as I mentioned, the message complexity scales in the length of the, uh, of the longest branch, plus one OR proof, which might communicate uh, maybe M messages, but then uh, only, only linear in, in M and independent of the circuit that you just showed. So yeah, the overall communication is, as I said, O of max of, um, of branch length, plus O of M for the OR proof, whereas the naive approach would be to uh, evaluate, to send something that uh, is the sum of all the, these, these circuits, so you save something that can be up to a factor of M. So this is, but this is only savings in communications, not in computation. As mentioned, you still have to recompute all these, uh, these commitments YI uh, to actually be able to do the OR proof, um, so you still have to compute on all the branches, you only save to commu in communication of all the branches. Actually, we can uh, modify our protocol um, where instead of showing that uh, one of the branches evaluates to zero, we can show that uh, K of these uh, evaluate to zero simultaneously, and then you use a threshold proof on the, um, uh, on the, uh, on the output commitments uh, to show that this is true. And here again, uh, we can uh, improve the communication from uh, you know, sending the sum of all the uh, circuit evaluations to something that scales in K times the, the longest branch plus, uh, plus the OR proof, or threshold OR proof in this case. And what we can also show is that we can, we can put the disjunctions inside this junction. So you can do a proof of a disjunction inside another disjunction, and this can be again inside another disjunction. So if you have, if you have a nesting of multiple disjunctions, then you can uh, still do that using our proof system. Um, I guess I'll skip that <laughs> as we are running out of time. Uh, maybe just mentioning quickly, so the OR proof in our uh, case has, has this uh, linear overhead. And what we actually show is that you can uh, do the OR proof much simpler on having only uh, logarithmic overhead in the number of branches. Um, okay, in terms of implementation, now I've talked to you about uh, all this mac and cheese stuff. Um, and, and you know, the question is, well, how, uh, how fast uh, is this thing actually? So we have an implementation of the offline and the online phase in Rust uh, based on the Swanky framework by Galois. It will be open source in the near future. It supports input from uh, ZK interface, which is now developing into a standard uh, interface for zero knowledge proof systems. We have uh, various fields that we support, such as F to the two, uh, F2 to the 61 minus one, which has nice uh, implementations, or F2. Uh, our our Mac and G's implementation supports nested disjunctions and these optimized modifications that I just mentioned. Uh, in terms of, um, in terms of performance, well, if we, if we let things run on a network with a 95 millisecond ping, uh, only 2.2 uh, megabytes per second uh, bandwidth, uh, then even if we pre-compute all the vector overlays, we have a, um, uh, we have 
a prover uh, or a proof that runs end to end uh, with the mentioned 1.5 microseconds per multiplication uh, in this field mentioned here or 140 nanoseconds per multiplication where 85 of these nanoseconds are just for just setting up the vector OLE. So the proof overhead over the vector OLE is, is really small. And if we have uh, if we have branches of let's say a billion end gates, um, then our uh, disjunction proof, right? If you have eight branches, um, it only uh, communicates uh, an extra 75 bytes uh, over uh, one. So if you want to prove one billion end gates, and you have eight branches, so in theory you would have to uh, communicate eight billion uh, end gates. And in our case, what we show is, well, you have to communicate the 1 billion end gates and without disjunction te techniques plus an additional 75 bytes to verify the OR proof. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you evaluated these, these end gates, uh, these end gate based circuits locally, uh, then, you know, you would, for example, for one branch need uh, 34 seconds. I, this is if I give you uh, the information in plane and so the proof overhead is only four times five uh, times uh, to do this in zero knowledge over uh, insecurely evaluating it okay um just uh to uh before i wrap up i want to mention uh that there are other uh, proof systems out there uh, that are following a similar approach, in particular designated verifier, um, zero knowledge proof systems. Uh, so uh, there's this work stack gobbling by Heath and Kolesnikov, which uses uh, zero knowledge proofs based on garbled circuits. So they also uh, allow for disjunctions, uh, but have but only work for for uh, for binary fields, and have a much larger communication than what we have. As the uh, Wolverine. Uh, which which has a, a higher number of uh, communication and uh, it works for F2 and and for FP for arbitrary P. We can probably also get the disjunctions to run there, but it communicates uh, more per multiplication than than we do. As the line points, your knowledge approach due to Ditma uh, at all, uh, which was the first to get down the uh, multiplication to get down the communication overhead to optimal, but there is no um, no implementation of this. There's a Quicksilver which adapts uh, the Ditma at all approach, um, which can uh, get an efficiency for the multiplication up to up to what we have. Their implementation performance is uh, even better in millions of multiplications per second that they can do. But unfortunately, to the best of our knowledge, we have uh, no idea how to get disjunctions to run in their uh, proof system. And with this, uh, I'd like to thank you. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about this uh, ATB protocol, but uh, yeah, if you're interested, I could uh, yeah uh, give a, either a short summary uh, offline or I can refer you to the respective uh, papers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor, for a very interesting talk. Um, let me first ask if the audience has any questions, anyone? Any questions, anyone? Otherwise, I will start. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes. Go ahead, Max. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk, Kastan. Uh, I have a question concerning your uh, proof size. Uh, so, uh, so, your proof size is growing linearly with the number of and gate a uh, number of multiplication gate in the circuit. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, did, um, did you test, uh, like, did you compare with, like, for example, schemes like Ligero plus uh, plus? I think we, uh, the schemes is growing uh, polylogarithmically with the, the number of gates. So, did you compare with them or? or uh... um, so you see, um, so we don't compare in the sense that uh, with uh, with snarks or uh, sublinear proofs. You very quickly see that their communication is just a lot better. Yeah. But if I remember correctly, then Ligero and Ligero plus plus should have a uh, logarith in, an overhead in the prover runtime that is logarithmic in the circuit size. So you run something that is in O of n log n, yeah. right? And if you the the the, the point uh, that I try to make is that 
if your prover is uh, just slightly above linear, um, you're really going to pay for this uh, if your proof size gets big. Like your prover has to go through the circuit as such, uh, but any additional uh, factor uh, that you have on top of this uh, is going to increase the prover runtime. In particular, once you go into the regime that has uh, circuits that are, you know, not just uh, a million gates, but a billion plus gates. So um, that's why we didn't really compare because for those circuit sizes, uh, I think all kind of other proof techniques would just, uh, you know, run out of memory and we would okay. run out of time. Yeah. So, uh, so basically your, your, uh, your schemes can handle like, uh, what is the maximum of number of gates you can handle uh, in your circuit? Oof. Good question. So um, we have uh, we have tested um, we have tested mac and cheese as I said with the uh, circuits that we needed 200 gigabytes to represent the circuit. Um, mac and cheese has the advantage that it can stream the circuit, so it just you know looks at parts the parts it's currently trying to prove, and then it proves these, and then it goes goes on with his life. Um, and that's why, I mean, the, the size is, uh, I guess it's, it's bounded by how long do you want to run your prover, but it's never uh, gonna really run out of memory eventually. Okay. Yeah, and but we're, we're optimizing this for, uh, for, for, for bigger statements, yes. Okay, yeah, sorry. And uh, so um, basically like, uh, so for example, like the protocol you so the, uh, so much proof using picnic signatures like uh, designed by uh, KXO KKW or ZKB++. Uh, they provide yeah. a post-quantum security. Uh, what about yeah. yours? Uh, did you study in a quantum record model? Or? Um, very good question. We didn't. Um, so, <laughs> um, so the online phase itself is only sending, uh, sending uh, you know, field elements and checking uh, linear relations. Uh, so I would be surprised if anything happens there. Um, our uh, pre-processing uh, uses uh, it, it uses LPN to extend uh, to create uh, the, the vector OLEs. So if you implement the base uh, some base OTs which you need using uh, some lattice lattice-based constructions or so or anything else that is post-quantum. Um, that might be a starting point of proving that the whole construction is post-quantum secure, uh, but we did no analysis in this regard so far. Okay, thanks. Thanks for, thanks, thanks. That's all for, for my side. Um, any other questions, anyone? Um, I'll, I'll ask one maybe quick question. So sure. when you, Talked about these disjunctions. Yeah. Uh, do we somehow want to hide which CI is satisfied or? Yes. And yeah, wh wh why is that? Because for, is this for zero knowledge? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's for, it is for zero knowledge, right? I mean, you don't want to, if, I mean, it, the whole thing is simple once you reveal which branch is true, right? But if you would reveal which branch is true, then you also wouldn't. Um, you wouldn't need to evaluate the other branches anyway, right? Because then you would just evaluate the one branch, tell the verifier this is the true one, and then only focus on this one, right? But it might reveal information about your input, which branch you're taking. Mm -hmm. So C itself doesn't reveal, but CIs might reveal information if the verifier knows that that's the correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's also why we. That's why we have to, you know, that's why both the proof and the verifier can still have to compute on all of the branches. Yeah, because they don't know which one is the true one, but you only communicate the one that is that is actually true, in a okay. way that doesn't reveal which one you communicated. Okay, I see. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. Is there any last question? Ron, did you have a question? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering also for the disjunctive proof. Um, yeah. So the circuits that are being all together, they, they can be quite different circuits. Yeah. So, so what, but uh, don't you need to send so the proof? Uh, uh, 
Um, Ron, I think you are sorted okay. on my side. Uh, yeah, I think your uh, your connection uh, is uh, a bit bad. If you maybe repeat, can repeat the question. Ah uh, yes, yes. Can you hear now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So th I was wondering the proofs that you send the proof that you send for the longest circuit. Uh, does it? Wouldn't it fail on the other circuits in the when you go along the intermediate gates because the circuit is is different in the other branch? Or that's a, so that's a really good point. Um, so if you um, so if you so the, the operations that we do are uh, essentially only um, sending random values and then there is this you know checking if something is zero or not, right? Mm -hmm. So we gotta push these uh, checks that something is zero, kind of to the end of the uh, of each of the sub circuits, because other, otherwise you're right, right? Otherwise you have um, you maybe you have intermediate, um, uh, you know, have parts of your sub circuits that don't really line up, and you 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 see things fail. So you kind of have to have to compile the individual sub circuits in a in a not too fancy way to to make them uh, alignable, so to speak. Mm -hmm, Does see. this answer your question, Ron? Yes, yes, thanks. Because at the point there is, it doesn't it doesn't make a difference when you show that something is zero. Um, the value is also going to be zero later, uh, for example, at the end of a branch. And from a, a honest prover perspective. Um, Right, nothing changes in terms of the zero knowledge property um, because uh, the proof is always going to go through anyway. This is the this would be the intuition there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I, I think I need to look at the at the paper to understand. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, yeah. Thanks. All right, I think for the sake of time. Yeah, sorry, uh, I have a last question if we still have time. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe quick yeah, sorry, see. thanks. Uh, it's again about the, the, signature, uh, the proof size. Uh, sorry to come back uh, about that. So if you have like more, uh, what understood is like if you have more T junction, then your signature size is going down, right? I mean, your proof size is going down. Yeah. But your uh, computation complexity is going down. Growing. So you don't, yeah, you don't pay more than uh, evaluating it uh, without. So you don't pay a lot more than evaluating it uh, without this uh, this junction optimization. Um, you still have the same compute time. You only lose, uh, so you only have less to 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 communicate. That's that's correct. Okay. So yeah, so I so like one solution for you to to decrease decrease your proof size. It will be like to have multiple disjunction. Yes, exactly. And okay. there you need there you need that whoever uh, gives you the circuit has to uh, you know has to have a higher level understanding of what you actually want to prove in order to um, to optimize uh, what they give you as input for that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, um, so thank you very much, Carson, for your very interesting talk. And thank you everyone for tuning in. I uh, hope to see everyone in the next seminar. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and uh, have a nice afternoon. Yeah, have a nice day.